Okay, so good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Aoife O'Driscoll. I'm a crop protection scientist at NIAB, having recently joined from ADAS. Um, I'll be taking over the work that Simon Kitely and Cheryl Turnbull um, have been doing on cabbage stem flea beetle. And today I'm going to talk about uh, NIAB's work to date to tackle this pest, which has focused on monitoring the geographical spread and intensity of flea beetle um, and exploring strategies to help farmers uh, get better crop establishment. So NIAB's research to date and to tackle this pest has focused on three main avenues. We've collected five years of crowdsourced data uh, from farmers up and down the country to monitor real time changes um, in damage due to flea beetle and to try and link this to information on production systems. In tandem with this, we've also been conducting um, insect trapping to monitor uh, changes in migration patterns and flea beetle populations and we've also done a lot of work on uh, companion cropping to help that crop get up and away and improve crop establishment. So as I mentioned earlier uh, over the last five years we've been collecting data nationally through our online survey which has evolved over time um, so looking at our 2019 survey, we asked farmers to provide details on how their crop was faring, ranging from experiencing little or no damage to complete crop failure, and also whether they had stopped growing oilseed rape completely. Um, we also collected a lot of data on uh, crop husbandry and agronomy. So in the 2019 survey, uh, we had a lot of responses, 1,127 responses to be exact. Um, I'm not normally a fan of starting with a negative, uh, but on the left picture here, uh, where all the red dots are, is where crop failure was recorded. And you can see that these extend quite far west, down as far as Exeter, and up, up uh, quite far north. Um, I think what's important to think about when you're looking at this data is what crop failure is recorded as. Um, you know, a lot of growers in the west and the north wouldn't be used to the same levels of uh, pressure and damage as growers in the east. So what they might be recording as crop failure could be very different to what um, a grower in the east would be used to. So next year um, in our crowdsourcing surveys, in order to kind of calibrate this a bit better, we're going to ask growers to take pictures of the crop so we can get a better measure of what crop failure is actually being, um, being recorded as. Um, middle picture then is uh, where all the green dots is where little or no damage was recorded. And yes, as you would expect, uh, we're seeing um, some really good crops up in Scotland and then farther down into Plymouth as well. But what's really encouraging is that we're seeing a lot of green dots in areas which we, we would consider normally as high be flea beetle pressure areas. And then on the right um, is all the responses combined. So a fairly broad geographical spread uh, for the data that we got last year. This slide compares 2018 to last year's responses. Um, so you can see that there's been a 3.5% increase in the number of growers who've just stopped growing altered rape altogether. We also saw a large decrease in the number of growers reporting uh, mild damage um, and a big increase in the number of, of growers reporting um, crop failure. So from 13% in 2018 up to 30% in 2019. Now this was for a variety of reasons, yes, flea beetle, but also flea beetle times other things going on, uh, which we'll come to in the next couple of slides. Um, and all these reasons were captured in the survey. So uh, no surprise based on uh, last year's summer and autumn. Major other reason for crop failure was drought. So sowing into too dry a seed bed, preventing good establishment, and then further lack of soil moisture um, in August and September. And then a whole raft of other contributing factors from soil type uh, to weed pressures um, to geese and deer destroying the crop. So in our surveys, we collected a lot of data on crop husbandry and agronomy, which I'm happy to discuss outside of this presentation. You can give me a call or email me. Um, but for the purposes of brevity, I'm just going to focus on um, three main factors and uh, how those factors relate to flea beetle damage. Um, the first of these is sowing date. So uh, in this graph, the purple bars reflect crop failure on the x-axis is sowing date. And what we saw was that uh, growers who sowed after the 18th of August 
saw a big increase in crop damage. Um, and we'll come back to this graph a little bit later, but how this relates to um, our trapping data and the migration patterns of the flea beetle. Uh, the second factor is seed treatments. So most of the growers surveyed um, weren't using seed treatments and you can see there's a fairly even distribution um, in the level of damage experience leaning towards crop failure, it could be argued, but even growers who were using seed treatments like Lumoposa, which is Centrilopole, um, or other options, uh, biological options or other uh, growth stimulators, they also experienced um, a lot of crop damage. So it's clear that seed treatments um, are only one part of this uh, very complicated puzzle. Does spraying help? Um, again, a big range in the number of pyrethroid sprays being applied. Um, so most farmers reported spraying one to two times throughout the season with varying levels of crop success. Um, the saddest bar on the graph for me is the one on the right hand side, um, which represents one grower who sprayed six times throughout the season. Um, so not only did he wipe out all of these beneficials within a couple of kilometers radius, uh, but he still saw crop failure. Um, and that's really sad. Um, but I guess this is why the crowdsourcing survey is so useful in getting this kind of real time on the ground data. What's really encouraging for me is uh, the bar on the left hand side, which shows uh, for growers who didn't spray at all, they over 50% of them saw little or no damage or mild damage to their crops. So it would be interesting to see what's going right for them. Was it the, the climate for that year or some other crop husbandry or agronomy reasons? A uh, quick note on insect trapping. Um, so we've been trapping over the last few years to monitor the migration timings of the flea, flea beetles in, uh, in our trial fields. We've been using three types of traps. So water traps um, on canes and placed on the ground and also sticky traps on the ground. Um, and we found that using these type, these three types of traps um, together kind of gives the most uh, representative results of what's happening in that field. So we've been linking our monitoring data um, with our survey responses. Um, and you'll see that I showed this graph previously. So this is the one showing um, the effect of sowing dates on crop losses. Um, so if we add in the cumulative data for the number of flea beetles caught at all of our locations and lay this over the sowing date graph. So as you said before, sowing after the 18th of August gave you the greatest increase in crop losses. However, this also coincided um, with the peak migration point for the flea beetle. Now, there's lots of ways this could be interpreted, and we hope there will, there will be numerous ways um, that we can incorporate this kind of data in the future um, into other modeling and uh, flea beetle prediction services going forward. Over the last five years, we've also done a lot of work looking at different companion crops and different companion crop mixes. And more recently, we've incorporated a few other elements into these trials, looking at different uh, seed rates of all seed rape, different seed treatments, including limoposa and also slurry. Um, there is a lot of information out there on companion crop choice. And I suppose the right answer from my point of view when deciding what to go with is it depends. It depends on what's right for your farm um, and your situation. The naive experience from five years of trials has been um, that white mustard is the most promising option. We've seen it reduce uh, both adult damage and larval numbers in every year we've had it in trials so far. The flea beetles do like it, um, but it manages to withstand the damage. There is still a lot of tweaking to be done to optimize um, seed rates and, and crop removal, however. Currently, we're advising to sow the mustard at two to three times the seed rate of all seed rates, which means that um, it could work, work well with um, clear field varieties. But you do need to spray it off um, as soon as the rate is well established enough to avoid competition. And that's something that does need a bit more um, investigating. Um, the work with slurry is ongoing. It definitely deters uh, the flea beetles, but whether that's purely down to deterring the flea beetles or some other nutritional aspect, we're not quite sure of that yet. Uh, we're also looking at other uh, other of smelly stuff options going forward as well. Um, and you know we are aware that uh, there's a lot of other projects out there advocating for different companion crops. 
Um, but the naive experience to date has been that we've seen no clear value um, from using buckwheat, spring beans or clover mixes. So a quick summary, um, from five years of crowdsourcing surveys and companion cropping studies, what have we learned? Um, but it all comes down to good establishment. So the NIAB message is to sow as early as possible in August as you can. Sow into moisture, sow into a good seedbed to minimise soil moisture loss during drilling. Pyrethroids won't save you, they won't do you or your beneficials any favours, so don't use them. And uh, seed treatments that are available are achieving very little. In general, um, conventionals have shown a small advantage over hybrids. Um, is it the case that high seed rate wins over early vigour? We haven't fully uh, answered that question yet. And from our companion and crop work, it appears that white mustard is the best option, um, but we've a, a good bit more work to, there to do to optimise uh, seed rates and most importantly, removal of the mustard. And then finally, just a, a massive uh, thank you and farewell to both Simon and Cheryl, who have been um, absolute titans, not just in, in uh, this flea beetle research over the last five years, but uh, for all seed rape research in general. Um, and in the retirement, uh, you've also got a new new team now in the form of me. So I'm crop protection scientist um, and the lead for flea beetle going forwards. Uh, and Colin Peters has also joined as um, the oil seeds and break crop specialist at NIAB. And a massive thank you to uh, Will, who's a senior field trials manager, and all the field team for the work they've done over the last five years um, with the companion crop work and, and capping work and helping us to get good data to inform our research. So thanks very much, and uh, I hope to hear from you or see you all in the future. Um, and yeah, thanks. <laughs>